So I've done the math. If people stop adding new packages today, we can run this show for another 26 years before we run out of packages to recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Although if last night's script that checks for renamed and moved packages has its way, we'll have zero packages next week <laughs> because it tried to remove about 95% of our packages yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that's it, folks. We had a good run. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are no more packages. They're, they're all gone. So which one of those is going to win is my question. What do you mean? The, of the ones that we recommend or? No, is will we either will we either go twenty six years and then run out, or will it uh, will it uh, succeed and remove all the packages tomorrow? Well, I think that's for us to merge, right? <laughs> it, could, it could have been done already if we were <laughs> merge happy. Ah, <laughs> uh, so so um. Yeah, it's a good time to take the diff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no straight to merge. <laughs> so, so, what do you think will our um, SPI build metrics look like in in twenty forty nine? Well. It's funny you should say that because one package that I was looking at uh, this week was a package called Relax by um, Thomas De Leon. And, and I know we're not doing package recommendations yet, but because you mentioned that, I thought it was worth bringing up because so, so the package itself is a, is a REST API client for Swift. Uh, I'm sure it's great, but, but that's not really what I want to talk about around it. What was interesting is that Thomas in the readme does his own supported platforms matrix which is not dynamic of course it's just written but it made me think about that that <clears throat> our matrix and how how it doesn't quite capture everything and of course it it's never going to capture everything that was not its intent but there was something quite subtle in what thomas did that i thought was worth talking about and that was he's he's got a, a each platform and then the minimum version of the platform that the package supports and it needs swift 5.7 but then actually the platform that it can deploy to can be a package previous to the x code that shipped with 5.7 if you're with me i i am not but <laughs> you're not with me okay nah. <laughs> um but but go on i'm sure the audience is i'm just i'll just be the i'll just be the the rubber duck <laughs> no i'm sure nobody is yeah i'm sure nobody is let me explain it a different way you need Xcode 14 to compile this package because you need Swift 5.7 and the only version of Xcode that comes with Swift 5.7 is Xcode 14. Uh -huh. But then you could deploy back to iOS 14 or macOS 12 because even though it needed 5.7 to compile, the deployment version can actually be previous. Right to the current version of iOS and macOS, of course. Right. And it's a really subtle, in fact, it's so subtle that it slipped past you. Yeah. But it's a really subtle, but quite important distinction to make. And it's not even something we attempt to capture. Right. And that's possible now because of ABI stability, right? Because before that was really closely tied, you couldn't back deploy to an older right. um, yeah. platform version. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, I mean, we, we do our best with our platform uh, matrix, but, uh, but it does show that even, even with the amount of work that goes into creating that platform matrix, we can't possibly yeah. represent the real world compatibility of, of, of every package. I wonder if, well, would it make even, would it make sense to, to try and cut, I mean, so what I'm, what I'm getting at, there's a. Minimum Swift version you need for development and one you potentially need for deployment. Most of the time they're probably the same, but I wonder if it's worth having you know, like a little explainer what the version is that we're showing there, which is a development version. I don't know. Right. Yeah. The one thing I don't want to do is make that matrix any more complicated than it currently is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's, um, that's about as much as, as it should be. Plus, I mean, it's, you shouldn't take that as gospel anyway, because sometimes it doesn't take much to expand compatibility or Swift, you know, either platform or Swift version. Swift version is probably easier to expand because, you know, especially in the 5X, if something runs on, on 5.6 and you need 5.5, you, you know, if you, if you spend a little time, you could probably make it work. I think await is probably the biggest showstopper there. And that's, that's quite easy to figure out. But wasn't async await also backported back to iOS 14 or 15, maybe? 14, I think? Well, it, I think it was in 5.5 to begin with. So that's probably a bad example. But um, before that, I don't think it was back deployable 
beyond 5.5. Five. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I need to check our matrix. <laughs> So, yeah, so your question of where will our matrix be in 26 years or however long it was, it will it will be much more complicated, but but at the same time still won't capture everything. Yeah. So what Swift version are we up to then? Is it like Swift 10? Well, they're not. Yeah, they're, they're not. They're not really. They're not really going. So iOS has a very stable, predictable release schedule. Yeah. Every year goes past. We get a new version of iOS. There's a next. Do we add one to the number? Swift is not playing the same game as uh, iOS. No, it looks like it's it's a two patch versions per year, and typically, well, four didn't go up that high, right? Four. What was the highest? Four x four. It was four point two. The last one. Well, I'm sure Swift will still be around in um, in twenty six years if Objective C is any. Well, Objective C will probably still be around. <laughs> Well, Objective C had almost no changes for twenty years. So. Yeah, <laughs> fair point. Actually, that's that, that's not true. That's, that's a little unfair. But it certainly didn't change. It it changed less in twenty years than Swift has changed in five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, interesting to think about, isn't it? To um to try and extrapolate. I mean, it never works really. I mean, there's there's shifts coming. Who knows what's going to what it's going to look like in in twenty six years? But um, platform wise, we'll probably see a few changes. I mean, there's. You know, this reality OS is um, out there. That's probably going to be another, yeah, maybe this summer, maybe next summer, there's going to be a new platform. We'll probably add Windows at some point, Wasm. So there's a lot of change coming to that as aspect of the build matrix probably fairly soon. Yeah. And I think I think Windows, Windows support in the platform matrix is something we should tackle reasonably soon um I, I i'm not i'm not going to put a yeah a, a time period on it but i certainly um i was having some conversations with people down at the Silverside swift conference and that topic came up several times uh, and i think it's something that we should that we should at least take a quick look into yeah how d does our builder tool does it even work with swift on windows at the moment i'm guessing it probably does but but who knows and then I mean, I know that for, for me, it's a very long time since I administered a Windows uh, server, uh, and I'm sure it's the same for you. We probably won't have to. I've just very recently thought about this a bit, and that was because there's a evolution, I think it's a, a pitch, it's not quite a proposal yet, about cross-compiling. Oh, I did see that, yeah. And bringing full toolchain support for cross-compiling. And I think that's that's the way we should try and do it, if at all possible, because if the results and uh, they should be they should be reliable. I mean, if it, it's part of the tool chain, right? We should be able to rely on that, and then it'll take away a lot of the headaches around different platform support. I mean, we might even then consider building Linux on on Macs, um, or you know, vice versa. But it'll it'll open up possibilities to simplify the way we run the platform compatibility while also expanding it and, and not you know going crazy because the Adding a different platform is one thing, but then managing the capacity because only only th those builders will only then be able to build that one platform, and that is terrible for capacity management. You know, like utilization and to make sure that you're not over on the provisioned on a certain slice. We had that uh -huh. problem early on when only, uh, or even right now, we have only one builder that could build uh, five seven because of how the macOS versions run and Xcode versions that require certain macOS versions. And that's a problem then if one builder is, isn't redundant and you know, struggles or has some outage or something, we rack up builds that aren't processed. And then because we only allow a certain depth of the build pipeline before we stop enqueuing new builds, one builder going down and filling up the pipelines with unprocessed builds for a certain platform will, will block the whole thing. And the more we have the ability to have builders be agnostic and be able to build any sort of Swift version or platform, the, the the better our redundancy, our utilization across the, the board. So I haven't looked into this proposal more than knowing it existed. Are you saying that you could build all of the Apple platforms on Linux at that point? Uh, Apple platforms, I'm not 100% sure because of the SDKs. Of course. That is probably a limitation that you will still, where you will stick the, the platform for. But I, th I think the other way around, Apple platforms should be able to build all the others because they won't have any any SDK dependencies, right? I mean, right. more than yeah. beyond what we see already, right? We have some Linux packages that need certain SDKs on, on Linux that we might have to provide 
per platform. But that's a sort of a different problem. But yes, potentially we would be able to just have Mac builders and, and run, you know, any kind of build off of those. The reason I asked the question the other way around was because one of the nice things about our Linux build environment is it's entirely uh, Dockerized. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the Mac builders are not. They just run versions of Xcode sitting on uh, sitting on a, a, a Mac um, operating system. And so there is that slight advantage of having Dockerized builds because it does isolate the build a little bit more than yeah. than we currently do on on our Mac build machines. To be honest, I think. The, th the package we talked about or the tool we talked about last time, TART, is is something that I still have in the back of my mind to solve that part on macOS as well. Right. Because with Ventura and, and Big Sur, we're already arriving at a place where soon Macs will be able to run at least virtualized any... So we will, we will be able to run any Mac, uh, Xcode version that we support on any Mac because we'll always be able to virtualize the required OS, you know, that needs to come in tandem with the Xcode version. So we'll probably be able to provide images that any of the builders can build, pull, just like our Linux builders pull the Docker images right now, and then run the builds virtualized. And I think in all my testing, I haven't seen any any big build penalty in in doing that. And I'm really, really hopeful that this will settle down and allow us to actually do that across the board. And that would actually make maintaining these machines much easier because all we need to do is set up base images just like we do for Linux right now. Set up base images with a macOS version and an Xcode version and those would be pulled by the builders for whatever Xcode and, and Swift version they, they're interested in building uh, and that way right. there isn't any managing of which yeah. builder can build what um, Swift version. It, it, any will be able to build any. Um, we've talked about this in the past and I, I was a little hesitant to, to, to go down the virtualization route. And I, after looking at TAR, I think we could definitely do it. But what I'd be keen to keep is either we do builds virtualized or we do builds just on the machine rather than trying to mix anything where like Xcode 14 builds just operate on the machine because they're in Ventura. Yeah. And so we, so the machine itself wouldn't even necessarily, in fact, it wouldn't have Xcode installed on it. It would just be a host. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I, I'd agree. I mean, there's probably going to be a phase where we test it and, you know, don't fully commit and have, like, you know, a couple of running initially to see how it works. But once it does, I absolutely agree. I mean, what's the point of streamlining that when you still run a mix um, of, of bare metal and virtualized machines? And just for consistency... Yeah, and it'll, it'll make managing the machines easy. I mean, you probably, you know, you still need to also update the base machine, but at least it's only an OS update then, which you probably don't need to be as up-to-date necessarily. But other than that, it's managing base images which get deployed across the board automatically. So there's no, there's no managing of, you know, five max or however many it is um, individually and, and Xcode versions. Yeah. So yeah, let's, uh, let's see how that goes. What we will need, though, is um, at least one more Mac builder to test that on because we're currently, <laughs> if we take any of those build machines out of our uh, rotation, we lose the ability to build uh, certain versions of uh, Swift. Yeah, can't, can't have enough Macs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Order one more. Well, we've almost, um, almost transitioned into news, haven't we? Is there anything else we want to cover? I put a new page up on the site today. It got merged in uh, this afternoon, um, and it's a it's a thank you page. Um, so it's a, a a thank you page on the the site, which is saying thank you to. I mean, we talked a little bit about this last episode, saying thank you to the corporate sponsors that, that who support the site, uh, our infrastructure sponsors who support the site, and then the hundred and so um, community sponsors. And so we have this page now where we have the corporate and the infrastructure sponsors at the top, and then everybody's GitHub profile and name and username if uh, if they also support the site through GitHub sponsors. So uh, that went live this afternoon. That's a nice little thank you to all the support that we get. Yeah, it's great. It looks really great with all the avatars on it to show who, who all is, is sponsoring. Really great to see. Well, and that's that was the that was the one quite nice thing when I was developing it is it does take a long time to scroll to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like <laughs> make make the list longer, everyone. 
Yes. <laughs> in fact, there is. Okay, so here's a, here's a little secret that most people probably wouldn't see. There is a little secret Easter egg at the bottom of the page. Oh, I did not see that. I need to um, I need to check that out. <laughs> Even Sven has the scroll to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's another bit of news. Um, we started adding uh, transcripts to our episodes recently, and there's a really nice tool I wanted to give a shout out to, which is called Mac Whisper by uh, Jordi Bruin, um, which is a Mac wrapper, I think Swift UI wrapper around uh, the Whisper transcription tool by OpenAI. And and I really like this. This is the kind of AP, uh, API <laughs> AI that I can I can get behind because it's it's pretty str- it, I mean it is straightforward what it does. It, it it ingests audio and transcribes it, so it takes tedium out of out of a chore and gives you really a, a really great result. So it allows different um, quality settings, and in the highest setting, it really produces remarkable results, like identifying laughter and even transcribing that into the text and identifying terms of art, you know, like we talked about Graviton, AWS, and all that stuff came out really great in the last episode. It's also great to warm up your MacBook uh, on a on a winter morning <laughs> when it's when it's way too cold to the touch. And because if you run this for a while, even a, a, an M1 Mac will get get warm and after five minutes, the, uh, the fans will start kicking in, you know, just a bit. So it's really nice. <laughs> The speed is also remarkable. I mean, it does take a while, but it's a it, it transcribes at about two x on a on an M1 Max, and that's with sixty percent utilization. It could probably go a bit faster. I'm not sure what the limit is, what well, limiting factor that it, there is, but it's a really great tool if you have audio, or I think it also does video. You could just drag the file into the window, um, and it'll it'll go off and give you timestamped um, transcription. So it gives you files that you can then. Uh, we added this to our YouTube stream as well, and then it has um, give subtitles to the stream. I mean, there's no video of us talking there, but you get you get like subtitles on the static image because it's timestamped. So that's it's a really really great tool. The results are fantastic. And um, when you say two X, do you mean double speed or half speed? So double speed. Double speed. So it, <laughs> it takes half as long as the actual uh, episode to transcribe yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. It's like our forty five minute episode took like i didn't actually time it exactly but after 10 minutes of running i had done half so i think it's i think it's roughly uh, would have taken like 20 ish minutes 20 minutes uh, to to do the whole 45 minutes the ironic thing there is that um when, when i export the podcast audio it is at uh, less than 1x speed it is it takes longer to export than it does to play back <laughs> while one to one speed and i think the reason for that is the filters that we add on to clean up the audio and, and make it sound reasonable and i think it's those that that are taking the, the the very long time right but it certainly does take a long time to export the audio interesting and that's you've got an m1 max as well right i do it's time to upgrade to uh, um, an M1 Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> Another bit of news. We've been talking about the Doc Uploader the last couple of episodes even. Uh, and this is now live. We have switched over thanks to a little help. So after the last episode, someone got in touch and helped us um, out to speed the whole uploading process a bit where we upload from the Lambda to S3. So that's, that's now running faster. It does need a couple of retries sometimes because we have we are, we try and upload so many files in, in such a short while that the S3 gives us um, rate limits. Um, I think you can actually request these to be lifted. That's probably something to look into. I, I heard there's ways to to get extra bandwidth or something or extra allowance, but it's certainly workable right now. We're not quite up against the lambda limit as tightly as we were before. So that's looking really good. This whole thing is, is a typical example of something that, that got complicated real fast. <laughs> and the, the thing is, experience only really ever reduces your level of surprise, but you never really get to the point where, you're, where you anticip- anticipate all the complication you, all the complicated stuff you end up dealing with. But there you go. It's, it's certainly been a way longer uh, task than I thought at the start. I think this started in... In December, right? We started. Yeah, it must have been yep. mid December when this whole piece of work started. Well, there we go. It's it's live now. And I think the the other bit of news on that is that it's not only live because I think last time we talked about it, we talked about only enabling it for very large packages. But if I understand correctly, it is now live 
actually for every package. So every package goes through that uh, Lambda upload uh, process, I think. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Which is good because that was always the eventual plan for, you know, to get it to there eventually. In, in reality, we've, we've got there very quickly, but it's never great to have two completely different code paths that something would go through. And so it's, it's good that we just have, this is the way that documentation gets uploaded now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing is because these are different components, which ping back to the server and, you know, you already have two different components that ping back in two different ways, essentially. And then also in, in two different code paths, the legacy code path and a new one. And it starts getting really confusing under which conditions, you know, which code path will be hit and ping back and managing all the versions. You know, the complexity here is, is, is really in that these are three components talking to each other in, in certain ways and, and managing how you, in which order you can deploy them so they don't break and, and that sort of stuff. It's always a bit fiddly to get that right when you deploy, you know, so you don't hit errors because stuff isn't, isn't on the right version and that sort of thing. One thing that struck me when I was thinking about this recently is there was a point in this project, um, in, in year one of this project, where deploying this app to a, a, a different site would have been a case of checking out the repository, making uh, a uh, Postgres database and running it. And then as we added the build system, that became more and more difficult to do and now we've got bits executing out on lambda as well and and it has it has left behind any hope of uh of, of anybody else i think being able to stand up a, a, a an instance of of this uh app now it's 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 grown it's grown too many arms and legs to be easily <laughs> um deployable by anyone else i think <laughs> yeah i mean you still can you know, and you you get quite far by just running the server and having the website and the database so you can do what most people actually see. But you're right, the dynamic part isn't really possible to replicate. You can still do a, a large part of the dynamic updating by running the ingestion and the analysis and the, you know, the fetching the data from GitHub and that sort of stuff. That is That is still possible standalone, but the build system really isn't or has never really been part of that dev cycle because yeah too many dependencies on 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 infrastructure uh, really yeah yeah absolutely well i guess it's it's a bit like you you know google search you can't run <laughs> i'm not sure how to do that but i guess there's, there's, there's just stuff you can't no although uh, do you remember i i remember a time when google sold um a search appliance which was we we had one so the google search appliance was a one u rack mountable uh, server it was bright yellow and you bought you bought it from google and you you mounted it in your rack and your intranet and it would do the google crawler through your intranet documents and then present you with a um a google search interface of your content as well as the internet's content <laughs> right well so for intranet purposes or just you so you have a local yeah search searchable copy index of of the internet no it was it was for searching private documents it was for searching internal company documents right i see interesting but they didn't ship it for very long i would imagine they only shipped it for a, f a few a few years two or three years i think yeah. um it was it was not a business that they really got into interesting but i do remember it and we did i, I don't know where it is now um lost in the in the but well, it's probably been recycled into some something else by now but uh, we did have one of these bright yellow Google search uh, appliances, that's what they were called. That's that's crazy. I never heard of this. That's that's really interesting. Uh, I'll see if I can find a, a link for the show notes. Bring your own Google. Nice. That's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> right. Do we have any other news? Don't think we have any other news. No. I think maybe it's time for package recommendations. Let's do the packages. I think I normally start us off, so why don't you start us this week, Sven? All right. I'll go for it. So the first package... I want to mention is called Sextant by Rocco Bowling. And this is an interesting package. It's, uh, what's, the, what's the description? High performance JSON path queries for Swift. So JSON path queries, I didn't actually know this is what they're called. I, I, I've sort of knew the syntax and, and because these are the things you can, you can spell out if you use the JQ um, command line tool. Right. If you're not familiar, JQ is something you can install with Homebrew. It's a little, little command line tool and you could pipe JSON into it or call it, you know, and then point it at a JSON file and it'll, 
it'll load that up, but you can also, you know, just for display purposes, I think it does, it does uh, syntax highlighting or coloring, uh, but you can also query um, the structure. So you can, you know, if, if it's an array element, you can pick out, you know, a certain number or, or range of elements. If it's an object, you can you can drill into it. You can pick out attributes, or if they're nested structures, you know you can go into the key path sort of. And these expressions that you can write to to do these queries, these these are called JSON path. And this library apparently adopts that specify. I, I think it's like a specification that is is portable. But it, certainly, it sounds like it. I, I didn't actually dig into it that deeply, but from the examples that I've seen, you you can reuse. Um, these common things to in your Swift code then and, and um, explore JSON objects, you know, and drill into them in quite a concise and, and easy fashion. Um, I think on the whole, this is a bit like regex for strings, you know, handle with care because with the succinctness of the syntax also comes, um, you know, the, the burden of maintaining it because this gets quite um, hard to parse quickly. <laughs> these these uh, expressions can be quite gnarly, but if you have one that you know that works, which is a bit like regex, right? If you have a regex that you know that works, that's a great way to get started with a regex on in Swift, right? Because you can just plug it in and let it do your filtering. And the same here, if you have one that works, you can bring it in and then use it with this library to extract data. I think one thing we could probably say about this is that it's no worse than a regex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it seems to be really fast. One of the pitches is, and, and actually has a performance comparison between this implementation and, and a few others, and it looks like this is a lot, a lot faster than, than most of them. So this seems to be a really nice tool. If you have a need for JSON paths, uh, check this out. Um, Sextant by Rocco Bowling. Um, that's great. And uh, I, I also am uh, a big fan of the uh, JQ tool that you mentioned. And one of, it's just a little tip with that JQ tool, if you have it installed, one of the most useful things it can do is if you, if you're curling some JSON from somewhere, um, uh, to, to display it on your screen, if you just pipe it through JQ with no parameters, it just pretty prints it for you. And that it's worth, <laughs> it's worth everything. It's worth having on your machine. If you only ever use it for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Then while we're on, on the topic of JSON command line tools, there's another one I started using re uh, recently. It's called FX, and what it does, I think it also has queries, but what it has most of all is you can pipe stuff in and then it becomes navigatable, so you can fold and unfold structures and drill into them, which is quite nice because if you have a large JSON, it can be really hard to, to find your way around inside it, and that has keyboard navigation right. to explore the, the file um, quite nicely. So that's, that's a, another quick tip. We should start calling this podcast Unix uh, indexing, <laughs> Unix tool indexing. <laughs> uh, okay, my first, well, actually, my first package is a pair of packages. I think it was the last episode that I recommended a Markdown package that was compatible with GitHub flavored Markdown. Well, this week, I've got two more Markdown packages. The first one... Um, is Markdown Text from Chaps Benkow, and it's similar in its in its uh, in its kind of intention to render Markdown natively inside an iOS or a macOS application, um, and it uses Swift UI for the the rendering. And what I really liked about this is that you can customize whenever you get a piece of Markdown and it's about to render it into a view. Uh, you can take control of that view and you can just add some view modifiers for it. Um, so for example, if you wanted custom unordered bullets, um, you could just add a dot foreground color UI view modifier and make those bullets blue. And I, I think that's quite a, a, a nice uh, technique using actually the power of SwiftUI view modifiers, which are re a really powerful way to customize how something looks. And so I quite like that. And then another one that also had a release recently, and both of these have had releases recently. That's how I found them but, uh, through the RSS feeds as normal. Uh, Markdown Text was last released five days ago. Been in development for five months, but uh, it had a release 1.1 five days ago. And the second package is Markdown View. So the first one was Markdown Text. The second one was Markdown View. And that is by uh, Lee Yanan. And... That also had a release three days ago, 1.0 release. It's been in development a similar amount of time for six months. 
So the unique thing about Markdown View is um, that it supports SVGs in the Markdown. So I've never seen that in a Markdown uh, parser before. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah so th this has fully compliant with uh, Common Mark standard. So not GitHub flavored Markdown. And, and Markdown text, the previous one also isn't GitHub flavored Markdown either. But it, this one does support SVG rendering. So it feels like between the three of these packages, we've got a really great Markdown solution. <laughs> the problem is they are three completely different packages, which is always a shame when writing any Markdown viewer is not going to be trivial. And you may hit that situation where you need one feature from each of these different packages, whether it's GitHub flavored Markdown, whether it's easy customization with SwiftUI views or whether it's SVG support. But I thought they were all three interesting ones and they solve uh, they solve a good problem in in a, a lot of, uh, you know, potentially a lot of apps. Well, here's to the person who's going to use all three of them and then use the GitHub marked out favorite one for the tables and the other one for <laughs> colored bullet points and then as a patchwork of markdown views. <laughs> you say that, but for quite a long time in the Swift Package Index pro project, we did have two I know. different markdown passes. One I that know. supported GitHub <laughs> and one that didn't. Uh, and then we eventually we eventually just uh, let GitHub render the readme's, and we got rid of our GitHub flavored one uh, yeah. for that. Nice. It's, it's great to see all these um, markdown renders coming up. Long live markdown. I say it's a, it, it's a format which I I. If I could write everything in Markdown, I would. Yeah. Um, my second package is called Discord BM by Marty Barami. And it's, uh, as the name implies, it's about Discord. And it's a package to create Discord bots um, or to, to post on, on Discord, I suppose. Bots, you know, going a bit beyond in the sense that you can also uh, create slash commands, which then execute uh, things in your, uh, in your, in your tool as you're writing. Um, the reason I kept an eye on this is A, there's been quite a number of beta releases um, recently uh, leading up to a 1.0 release, but also we are probably going to switch our monitoring reporting over to Discord. So what we're doing right now, we've hooked all our reporting whenever there's an alert or something going on or a deployment, we're actually posting those to Telegram right now, which is a channel that we can both check and where we see what's going on, but we're actually going to switch that over to our to our own Discord, um, and that's that then allows us to see it there and you know just not have have Telegram running running all the time, but it'll also allow people in our dedicated Discord to actually see those uh, channels and you know have a quick way of checking if if there's potentially something wrong because often when an alert fires, I might um, post something there to explain, you know, I'm, I'm looking into it, or I think this is, this is the reason and, and so that sort of stuff. So people can actually have more use of our discord, um, by being able to see what's going on. And obviously also our, our um, deployments are posted there. So, um, that's the reason I looked into it and that I found this package and it looks really nice. I'm kind of looking for an excuse to also maybe build a bot. I'm not sure if there's anything we could potentially <laughs> do. Maybe you could add a package by having a command in our discord. That might be nice. For, for, put in a URL and then it goes off and adds a pull request, something like that. It's, you know, it might be, might be some ideas there. There we go. Yep. To, to play with it. It's probably worth mentioning our discord, uh, for people who are not familiar with it. Um, so yeah. our discord is public and the link to our discord is a, there's a, an open invite in the, uh, projects readme file. So that's uh, swift package index slash swift package index hyphen server on GitHub. Uh, and if you read down the readme or just search the readme for the word discord, you'll find a link to our discord. And if you, if you do pop in, uh, say hi and uh, let us know that you found it through the podcast, because that'll be, that'll be nice to know. Uh, but yes, it's an open discord. If you're interested in contributing to the project, or if you just want to chat about the project, or I mean, I'm sure this will never happen, but if there's any kind of problem with the website, you can also uh, talk to us there about it. Absolutely. Come and stop by. So my next package is from Apple, actually, and it's uh, Stable Diffusion. So you may have heard of Stable Diffusion before. It's one of these AI uh, image generation models, uh, or it's a tool that, that exercises one of those image generation models. And it's interesting because Apple have put some effort into, they obviously haven't written Stable Diffusion, but they've put some effort into making Stable Diffusion run well 
on Apple Silicon using uh, Core ML. And I just think this is quite an interesting thing for them to get involved with. So I have I have lots of mixed feelings about all of these AIs. Uh, if you've if you've been reading iOS Dev Weekly for any amount of time, you've probably read some of my mixed feelings about all of these AIs. And I I do ha I definitely do have questions about how we are potentially taking millions, if not billions, of hours of human effort and and using to, them to make some tech companies richer, <laughs> um, which I'm not, you know, not, not, I don't feel great about that, to be honest, but I do actually find, especially the image generation fascinating. And I've been playing with, um, with one of them called mid journey for a little while now, and, uh, I've been having a great time, uh, with that. So there's two parts to this, uh, repository on, uh, stable diffusion that Apple have, have created. There is a Python package, which will convert the models to core ML format. And then there is a Swift package that developers can add to, you know, you can add to see your Xcode project um, to deploy image generation capabilities inside one of your apps. And of course, that depends on the Core ML model that comes along it. Yeah. So I just think this is, this is interesting for a few reasons. And it's not something I would have expected Apple to get involved with. Yeah, it's really interesting to see. I saw that fly by as well. And I think it's... It's used in some of the apps that popped up when Stable Diffusion came out, right? There's a couple of apps on the App Store, I think even on the iPad, um, at least one of them that I've seen. Yes. And this package has only been around for two months, so it's it's really quite new. But of course, I'm sure it was possible to run Stable, I mean, Stable Diffusion is an open source project, so I'm sure it was possible to run it without these core ML optimizations, but anything that can make it faster, anything that can make it take advantage of uh, Apple Silicon is, is better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has dedicated chips, right, for that sort of stuff. So I would imagine that's that should probably give it quite a good boost. It'd be interesting to hear um, what the performance difference is. I haven't seen any um, any benchmarks or anything, but it must be it must be considerable. There are actually some benchmarks in the in the README, but they are not benchmarks against non-optimized versions. They are just benchmarks against different versions of uh, stable diffusion and different different Apple Silicon iPads and laptops. Right, right, okay. So not really, they're, they're benchmarks, but not in the sense that maybe you were looking for. Yeah, interesting. Right, so my third pick is actually a bunch of picks. <laughs> and I'm, I'm picking the category of uh, Mastodon client libraries. And this sort of was triggered by a release that I've seen this week, which is called Toot SDK by Konstantin Kostov and uh, David Wood. And this is, you know, the, as the name applies, so this is a, a client library where you can um, interface with Mastodon. Mastodon, obviously, the sort of new-ish, or uh, at, at least new in the sense that it's been recently quite popular, Twitter replacement or social microblogging network. And this is an SDK which allows you to log in, you know, get, get your login token and then pull down the timeline make posts and, and all the sorts of stuff that the uh, Mastodon SDK um, offers or API offers. But I didn't want to mention just this one because there have actually been quite a number of other client libraries that I've seen. And, and because people asked just recently, I saw someone ask what Mastodon libraries there are. And I answered with a link to our search page for searching for Mastodon. So there's currently four packages all in all that are tagged with Mastodon Toot SDK being one and the most recent entry. And then there are two other packages that have been around for around five years. Uh, one is called Mastodon Kit, is is by um, orth ornithologist coder. <laughs> so I'm not sure who that person is, but it's mainly one person driving that one. The other one is called Mastodon.swift, which is by Markus Kida and uh, Thomas Bonk. Uh, that's also been in development for five years. And the third one is by Bay Lay, uh, Mastodon API. That's been out for eight months, but I think it has a longer history because Bailey is the author of Mastoot, which is quite a popular um, Mastodon client, the one I, I used for quite a while initially. Very feature-rich client. Um, it's been around for a long time. So this isn't just a client that's popped up this fall. It's been around for, for way longer. Yeah, and all of these seem to be really quite mature and, and, and good client libraries for Mastodon. So if you're looking to write a Mastodon client, which seems to be the um, JSON parser of, of 
the 22, 23 years, this is probably a good place to start unless you also want to, to do that bit first and <laughs> go the whole way by or while implementing your client. I, I did uh, I did get an email about um, uh, about this from somebody who was recommending uh, that I check it out in case it was uh, worth a link in uh, iOS Dev Weekly. And I must admit, I, I did think for a second, I'm, I'm not sure we need any more Mastodon clients. <laughs> There, there can't be too many. They're just bring them on. There's, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's really exciting. It's great. And what's really interesting is how different they are, they actually are. You know, little features. They, I for quite a while now, I've been using a mix. So I'm using Mona on the Mac. I'm using Ivory on iOS. I use Masterwood when I need to edit because you know most of the others don't support that. It's and they all have certain things that they do either. They're the only ones that do it, or they do it better. And it's it's quite interesting, quite a rich um, rich environment there. It's fun fun times. I think the the question we need to ask ourselves is um, on the package index: Are there more Markdown view creators or Mastodon SDK <laughs> packages? It's a, it's a race. <laughs> at least at least the era of before JSON parsing was built into the standard libraries. <laughs> the JSON parser library was the the library to write. Yeah, yeah, that was what my reference was about. It's I imagine Mastodon supported Markdown rendering. Wouldn't that be awesome? You could you could throw that in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't it support Markdown? That's a great question. Anyway, before we even get into that topic. Um, I think we should uh, wrap it up for this week. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And like I said, in when we were talking about the Discord, please do come and join us in our Discord. We are, are more than happy to have people who are interested in the project uh, uh, come in there. And um, yeah, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Yeah, stop by in our Discord and see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, so stopping the recording.